Welcome to the Hot Zone Podcast. I'm Chuck Holden. And on today's episode, we're going to talk to Lieutenant Colonel Peter Lerner. He's a former IDF spokesperson for the Israeli Defense Forces. And we're going to talk to him about Israel. That's coming up. This is the Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Okay, so uh, we have talked about Israel a lot on this show, and uh, of course there's been a lot to talk about, and so I thought we'd get an expert on with us, somebody who has, uh, uh, we've got Kurt, Colonel Lerner, can you tell me how long you spent in the military and give me a little bit of background about your uh, your career? Sure, Chuck. I spent a quarter of a century in the Israel Defense Forces, always, always on the threshold of conflict, crisis, and controversy. Um, my position, my final position in the military, I was the chief spokesperson communicating to the world across uh, traditional media, social media, and uh, on behalf of the IDF. And it was highlighted specifically in our last conflict with Gaza in 2014, uh, Operation Protective Edge, which was the longest military operation the IDF has had um, probably since the, the War of Independence. You know, one thing that I have often said is that the IDF does a fantastic job in the media battle space, uh, telling its story uh, getting the word out about the true risks and dangers that the Israelis face every day. Tell me a little bit more about uh, how you, your, your strategy for that media battle space. So communicating in times of crisis, I think, boils down to two main components. First of all, do people consider you to be a, um, not only a legitimate, but a truthworthy uh, source of information? And what we tried to do on both online and on camera was basically make ourselves um, available and communicative to the different audiences. So I think that is probably the most important thing in any communication effort, where that you are a truthworthy source of information that people will come to you in order to get that information. And that is what basically what we were trying to do. Um, you know, so we would air pitch, you know, hundreds and thousands of stories every year to the world media. We would, we had probably a pioneering social media presence all from early days of 2009. We had, uh, YouTube, or we were already present on YouTube and millions of followers today on Facebook and on Twitter and in multiple languages. So the idea was making ourselves available, making ourselves be a truthworthy, considered, um, source of information. And basically keeping the punch and, and trying to constantly be above and ahead of the curve. Yeah. And, you know, I think you could teach the U.S. military a lot about that. One of the unfortunate things that I've kind of seen over the last 15 years as I've covered the U.S. military is that they've become more and more reticent to let you do any reporting about them. And I'm not sure exactly why that is. I know that the culture of the U.S. military changed a lot during the Obama administration. But, uh, you know, even when you have a friendly uh, media presence like Fox News or, or, you know, the Christian Broadcasting Network or something like that, uh, coming and saying, we want to tell the story of the good work that your people are doing, uh, they would very often just turn us down flat and say, we don't want any, we don't want you to come talk to us. Or if they did allow us to come talk to us, that institutional timidity worked its way into their culture so badly that they would send somebody out with me and say, no, 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 you can't, wait, 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 don't film that, wait, don't talk about that, you know. And it, it, it almost made them, well, not almost, it absolutely made them look worse because when you're that reticent to talk about your, even your successes, it makes you look like you're hiding something. Uh, would you agree? Uh, well, you have to keep in mind, first of all, that the military is hiding a lot. Um, you know, the element of surprise when you want to surprise your enemies is based on the fact that you are hiding stuff. Uh, but in this day and age where everybody has, you know, these social media and citizen journalism on, on, on mobile phones, it means you have to be aware and prepare in order to not wait until the journalist has a story and, and asks you for a question. You need to try and pitch as much as possible, keep them as busy as possible based on 
what you can tell and the story you want to tell. So that basically leads us to, to the, the reason for our conversation today. What we wanted to talk about, obviously, was not the nitty gritty issues of um, the West Bank. We wanted to talk about the serious issues that we have with Iran or with Hezbollah. Uh, we wanted to share the concerns we have with ISIS, with the Islamic State on our borders, with whether it be Syria or in, in the Sinai with Egypt. Um, and, and I think basically what we try to do is create access to journalists that they found newsworthy stories in the issues that we were giving them. Um, we also wanted to appeal to broader audiences that don't necessarily engage or aren't really interested or under-informed with the IDF and share you know, global trend issues like uh, um, the use of green energy or high-tech or technology or different types of things like that, which would appeal to other audiences that would otherwise not show any interest on, in the IDF. So um, I think, you know, it is you know, I think there is an inherent suspicion from military personnel basically to communicate beyond the military, which I, is understandable. But there is definitely a lot of room between the secrets that need to be kept on one hand and the truths that need to be told on the other hand. And I think that is the, the, the vacuum and the spectrum of where we wanted to operate in order to um, communicate Israel's story. And you've got a real uphill battle with that because... There are so many out there who just want nothing more than to bash Israel, even among your supposed allies. And uh, so you've, you, I think, done a great job of sort of countering that by being very transparent where you can afford to be transparent, obviously, without telling bad people things that they don't need to know. Uh, and uh, that's one of the things that's been very enjoyable about uh, b- making use of the media that you're putting out because you you do a good job at that. Now, Tell me what it's like for people living, let's say, in Sderot or somewhere in, in southern Israel, close to the Gaza Strip, and, and what daily life is like for those people? What do they go through? So for the last 17 years, um, the border communities of uh, around Gaza have not known a sense of normalcy like perhaps most people experience in the Western world. Uh, there is this constant looming threat that something is going to explode or detonate, whether it be a mortar bomb or in the last year, Hamas in in Gaza have have, uh, um, evolved to sending over different kinds of kites and and balloons, which are literally being used as launching capabilities for other incendiary and explosive devices. So the reality of anybody living in and around that border is a constant state of I would say stress and preparedness. Um, but I think, you know, what is, what is unique about the people that are, that live down there? And, you know, when I say live down there, it's, it's an hour's drive from the heart of, of Israel. It's, you know, it's a short drive from Tel Aviv in an hour's time. You are in those communities and it's a whole different type of mindset. You go from, you know, from state of normal day to day, behavior and routine to a state of emergency from one minute to the next. And I think, you know, that is what it makes this little country so special because we understand that that is a reality that we have to live with, but we don't let it get in our way. We let that actually be a power, a, a, a component of our strength of growing and the ability to actually grow from that constant sense of instability and insecurity. Um, so where does the startup nation come from it comes from that sense it comes from being able to deliver every single time when you have little resources um uh, but a clear issue that you need to solve like rockets being fired at you so the idf and and with our american support uh, and the defense industry developed the iron dome missile defense system which is it's unbelievable it's an unbelievable piece of technology and and those are the types of things or a, a subterranean barrier that prevents them from tunneling into Israel. Um, you know, last year alone, the, the IDF revealed some 15 tunnels penetrating into Israel from the Gaza Strip. Um, and, 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 and this is a reality that can happen. And, and, and the people living around there, they acknowledge that and they realize it. Um, I, I would say that the Gaza Strip today is probably the most insecure cop, uh, front that the IDF is facing and that Israel is facing as a whole. 
Um, despite the fact that nobody actually wants to have any sort of conflict there, um, I think Hamas is trying to maintain a level of friction without it deteriorating into a, another war. Uh, on an Israel side, we have no interest in going to war there like, than, than any other, other than, I don't know, um, Texas going to war with, with Mexico. Uh, the, the reality here is one where it's a, a standoff situation where they have interests that they're trying to promote. They're trying to do that with violence. And Israel needs to constantly be prepared for, for that violence. And that is basically what the IDF is doing. Um, I would say, though, and I think this is really important for your, for your listeners and viewers to understand. Hamas is not a strategic threat for Israel. They don't have anything that can inflict mass damage or mass casualties. The types of attacks that they conduct against us are terrorism. The terrorism generally is focused at, um, I would say, small impact, small physical impact with a huge um, projected impact. So if you're able, if you, and the media plays part of that. Media is part of amplifying the devastation that terrorists can do. And of course, that has a psychological impact. It has physical impact. It has uh, um, individual sense of security impact. And those are the types of things that Hamas can deal to Israel. And of course, if there is a battle or another war and and, and the recent assessment suggests that that is a, a, a possibility in the coming year. Um, so we need to be prepared for that, but, but also acknowledge that they don't have anything that can strategically push us back into the sea or uh, eliminate the state of Israel. We have much bigger problems with Hezbollah well, but, and Lebanon. Now, yeah, I mean, and obviously we, we've talked for a long time about uh, the issues with what's happening in Syria right now and Iran uh, trying to establish that land bridge from Tehran into Lebanon and, and that sort of thing. But before we get to that, let's just uh, give me a short answer on it. There were for weeks and weeks and weeks, these massive protests on the Gaza border uh, with Israel with up to 30,000 people coming up and trying to penetrate that border barrier. What would have happened if they had been able to breach that fence and flood into Israel en masse? Fantastic question. So, you know, the stated um, mission was to, um, they called it the March of the Return. And none of the mainstream media seemed to give much thought in what that actually means for Israel. But what they actually meant, and we found in the aftermath of several events, they had aerial photographs directing them how to reach civilian communities. So what that actually meant, and how Israel portrayed and understood this threat is that anybody that breaches the, the the border, anybody that breaches the security fence surrounding the Gaza Strip is headed to Israeli communities. That is something which would be unacceptable. It would be an unacceptable threat, potentially could deteriorate the situation into a war. And that, that's why we used all of the methods uh, uh, at hand in order to prevent them from infiltrating and penetrating that border. Um, including live fire, which was lethal at times. Um, it's an unfortunate situation, but we blame Hamas for that because they sent people to the fence. They didn't sit down and sing Kumbaya. No, they were coming there to break down the fence. As one of the Hamas leaders said openly, and it was broadcasted on Al Jazeera, we're going to tear down the, the fence and rip out their hearts. Unfortunately, nobody thought that that was newsworthy to even cover, but this is what how we believe their main goal is actually all about. I've always thought if somebody says they're going to hurt you, you should always take them at their word until they prove otherwise. But uh, when did, when was that current fence uh, built? I was down there. It's a 30-foot concrete wall, and then there's a barrier in front of that with barbed wire and that sort of thing. When was that particular barrier put in? Do you know? So um, uh, around 2000, and uh, the current border fence is, is from around 2006, but there were border fences even from, from from beforehand, from the late 90s. Um, it's actually being revamped now. So what you saw, you saw the, what, by, from your description, you saw the, the areas which are on the most northern part of the border, which are actually made out of concrete slabs. And those are there to prevent direct fire against the houses of civilian communities. But going on the eastern side of the Gaza Strip, or on the western side of Israel, between Israel and Gaza, is actually a chain-link fence with, little much more than a, 
um, electronic indicators so that if somebody touches it, you know that where they're going. Of course, we have lots of surveillance capabilities there and a, a huge amount of forces on the border itself because of that reality. You know, it has actually been going on. And on the 30th of March, it will be a year uh, that these weekly riots have gone on. So we're every single week they are there. And they've developed it into a whole strategy where they conduct night attacks or night riots where they tear, tear down the fence and they use explosive devices um, uh, at the fence, above the fence. They send them over the fence with with uh, with balloons and, and, and with, you know, balloons are supposed to be a happy thing. I have a seven year old kid. She loves balloons. Uh, but using these balloons in people in the South, when they look up and they see balloons, they have to run. Yeah, and I know they've lost at least one Israeli soldier uh, to the, those riots. And um, they're, they're very clear about their intentions there. So let's talk about the Syrian border for a, for a moment. Uh, explain to me, to, to our listeners, why Israel has to take such a hard line on Iran establishing a foothold in Syria. Um, I would say it, it boils down to two main components. First of all, Iran has a ballistic missile capability which can reach from Tehran today all the way up to all the way to Europe if they wish to do so. Um, but the distance between Jerusalem and Tehran is something like 2,000 kilometers. If they are able to pitch up fort on the Golan Heights in Syria, then it's a matter of a few hundred kilometers. So the shared distance means that they have a bigger arsenal that they could potentially use against Israel. We're not letting that happen. Um, and the second component is you know, Hezbollah in Lebanon and the Houthis in Yemen. Um, they are all um, tools in the hands of Iran. We yeah, don't proxy. want another, yeah, proxies. We don't want to have another proxy like situation on another border of Israel. Because that, again, would make the threat even more present than it already is. We don't need that to happen. You know, they, they support Hamas. They support Hezbollah. They support, support the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Uh, we don't need another front with another enemy on our border immediately. Definitely not one in the, of the likes of Iran. And I think Israel has been very, very clear in the message by conducting st strikes throughout Syria against the Iranian um, activities, intelligence, force building capabilities, aerial capabilities, sending them a clear message. Um, the nature of these types of things, though, you know, there's this evolution and, and they will evolve and they will find ways to set up some sort of presence in Iran. They had a plan to bring um, um, Shiite militias there, like the Houthis in uh, uh, in Yemen. You, they had you mean from Syria. Iraq. Into Syria, a hundred thousand yeah. Shiites from wow. Iraq and and the region, and and that has been foiled in the meantime. Um, and they've had their own military and and air, air force presence there that has been foiled a couple of times. So I think our intelligence gathering capabilities and our you know kinetic capabilities and force building cap capabilities are very much geared to preventing that presence there. And the Prime Minister Netanyahu said that that can never be a reality, and I tend to agree with him. Well, I think that the other thing the media has kind of failed to report about Israel is that they've been exceedingly generous with the Syrian people in treating the wounded that have come to the border fence and even bringing people into Israel and, and treating them and, and uh, establishing even a, a clinic inside Syria, just across the border. I know uh, my friend Oliver North uh, went in and, and reported on that. We've talked about that a little bit on this show as, as well. So, um, I, you know, I've been to Israel several times. And one of the things that always strikes me about that is that knowing what the IDF is facing, knowing what you guys have to go through on a daily basis to try to keep the people of Israel safe, when you go there as a tourist, you don't feel that sense of tension so much. You don't feel that sense of, of danger uh, being surrounded by enemies on all sides because, and I, I think it's because the IDF does such a great job of keeping the wolves at bay, so to speak. So I would say I would definitely, you know, 2018 was the first year since the establishment of the state of Israel that Israel crossed the 4 million um, 
tourists. It was the first year, first year since our establishment. And it's despite all of the threats that we have and despite the sensitive security situations that I, uh, that I described, for sure, uh, part of it is because people trust the Israeli military and trust the Israeli security forces to deliver security. But I think, you know, people realize, and, if, and I would say, suggest to your, to your listeners, if you haven't planned your summer holidays or haven't planned your uh, Christmas holidays, come to Israel. Come and see for yourself. Come and ex- get the Israel experience because I promise you there is nothing like it. We have everything here from north to south. You can have every type of experience that you would like. Um, so I would say, yeah, the, you know, with the state of uh, terrorism globally uh, and the situation here, it's not necessarily very unique. But if you're going to have a, a terrorist situation scenario anywhere in the world, where would you prefer to be? I would, I would definitely say Israel. I would wholeheartedly agree. Absolutely. And uh, we're out of time for today, but uh, man, I certainly appreciate you coming on, Colonel Lerner, and uh, just giving us a better perspective about what's going on in Israel. I uh, thank you for your time, and I hope we can get you on again. Sure. Thanks, Chuck. Great to be here. All right. That's it for today's Hot Zone. Thanks for watching. We'll be back again tomorrow. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.